Probably not, not one of the, um, you know, one of our attendees that traveled the farthest. There are a few people who traveled further. Um, but it's with, uh, you know, great pleasure. It's an honor to have with us here today Professor Vuk Marievich from Mississippi State University. Um, so it's, it, we, uh, both Vuk and I have a kind of a combined uh, history ever since Dublin, Ireland. So whatever happened in Ireland stayed in Ireland? No, not really. Uh, uh, we were at a software-defined radio summer school um, many years ago. It was organized by some friends at Trinity College Dublin. We met then. Vuk was a PhD student at, uh, at Polytechnica uh, University uh, uh, Catalonia, right, that I said? Uh, so basically UPC. And uh, he was implementing, I believe, was a software-defined radio framework. And then he got, he you know, moved to the United States, worked for a while at Virginia Tech, and is now on faculty at Mississippi State. And he'll be sharing with us some of his work in the 4G, 5G world with respect to security analysis. So with that, let us welcome Vuk Marievich. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking, sticking here and watching my talk. So as Alex mentioned, I come from Europe. I did my PhD at UPC Barcelona Tech. I started looking at software radius in 2003 and then continued uh, all the way through Virginia Tech and now Mississippi State University. And recently, my interest became more on cellular networks. We developed some of the early versions of the open source LTE frameworks that are out there for real-time processing with software radios. And thanks to that, we could do some analysis in terms of security, radio access network security for LTE. And the next step will be 5G. Um, please interrupt me anytime if you have questions or comments. Good, let's get started. So you may have seen uh, every now and then there are news how cellular networks or wireless networks are insecure, right? So I picked uh, two uh, headlines here from last year, 2018. So they, uh, the DHS uh, uh, acknowledged that there are stingrays out there. Stingrays are fake base stations that try to get your user identity out of your LTE phone, let's say. And uh, what they do is once they have the user identity, they can track you. They can know where you are, where you roam, where you move, etc. right? So that's not, not good for privacy and can also be a big issue for security. And uh, what oftentimes happens is there's finger pointing. Who is the... Who's responsible for this? What has been done wrong? Is it standardization? Is it the implementation? Is it uh, regulation, right? And uh, uh, it's a complex problem. Uh, we can talk about it for hours, but I don't want to talk about this. It's just that um, there are always ways, right, to, to circumvent all the security mechanisms that you have, but you should have good security mechanisms in place to avoid things like that. Um, Good. So, in the meantime, over the past few years and ongoing, right, the cellular industry is developing and deploying 5G technology. And uh, 5G will be great. It will be, have lots of different new applications not enabled by LTE in previous generations that require, for instance, massive connectivity, advanced enhanced broadband services, or lower latencies for control type uh, applications such as robots, drones, or uh, smart vehicles and, and all those things that can help us to move safe, safer through the world. Um, so that's good, and it will enable a lot of new businesses and markets. And here is a picture also from Qualcomm that I took, I borrowed. So LTE will not go away. LTE provides worldwide coverage almost anywhere, and uh, it's good at that, and it provides also decent broadband services. But there will be 5G developed on top of it that provide you like high capacity hotspots or uh, uh, networks or better connectivity among cars and, and drones and so forth. So what we'll have, you'll have an ecosystem, I believe, like this, where the LTE and 5G coexists and, and different types of network configurations or different types of generations can provide you better services in one way or the other. Okay, so that said, it is, uh, obvious that uh, some of these will be critical services, right? If drones are uh, autonomous and maybe controlled through, uh, controlled not only to sensors, but also through communications, those communications need to be reliable and secure. Same for cars, autonomous driving, right? Or uh, assisted driving, 
V2V, vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communications, then all those IoT sensors that can uh, maybe power your city or power the lamppost and so forth, turn, uh, light the lamppost, so those need to be secure, reliable, and resilient. So in order for that to, be, uh, to exist and coexist, we need secure networks. And we need to look at the security. Okay, so this is the outline of my talk. Uh, it's not, sorry. So what I want to do is t talk about, uh, we posed ourselves these questions, are modern cellular networks vulnerable to radio access network signaling attacks? And this was a few years ago, let's say 2013, 14, when those soft radio tools that I partially developed became available. So we wanted to look what are the most critical subsystems in, in, in that time of LTE that, uh, and how vulnerable are, are they to attacks. So, and then can we quantify the vulnerability and can we do something about it, make the system harder to intercept or harder to interfere with? And then finally, what can we do beyond just uh, pencil and paper and simulations, can we actually use software radios to help us out? So now the outline of my talk. Um, I will provide you a brief LTE signaling background uh, in case you're not too familiar with it. And I'll only talk about those things that occur later on in the presentations. Um, then I will uh, show you our software development, uh, software radio tools that we developed, and uh, some results and what type of tests we did with LTE and what our, our conclusions are, and then finally talk about uh, 5G as well. Okay, so the set is the context of this talk. The LT network, uh, also similar as the, well, the 5G network, we, we, we have a radio access network here that consists of base stations that service UEs um, through the wireless uh, interface, and then we have the core network, in this case the evolved packet core it's called, so that gives you then data access to operators' IP services. Um, so our focus is the radio access network, um, where the base stations and the UEs talk over the wireless link, and this is how the UE actually accesses the operator services, through the base station, right? So what is special about 4G LTE uh, with respect to previous generations? Well, there are better security mechanisms. Uh, one of them is both the UE authentic authenticates the base station or the network, and the network authenticates the UE before services are offered, okay? However, um, and I can mention this now, that everything that happens before this authentication is signaling in the clear. So all the signaling that happens before uh, these guys authenticate themselves or not is sent in the clear, so all the signaling is um, unencrypted. And this is a little bit different in 5G, but um, principally is similar. Okay, so how, uh, what, how does the physical layer look like? So as you probably all know that LT uses also OFDM, and 5G and R also use OFDM, it's a multi-carrier waveform. You can think of this as uh, splitting up your wideband uh, channel or frequency band into tiny channels, or we, we call them sub-carriers, right? Each sub-carrier carries uh, information and all together provide you the uh, large throughput. If we make the analogy with a big water pipe that, that sends out tiny uh, streams through the shower head, and we think of water drops going out, we can think of these channels carrying uh, modulation symbols, all in parallel, right? So, and the modulation symbol can be up to 256 quam, I believe, nowadays. Okay, so now, this is the LTE resource grid. What we have here, if you look at the frequency over time, and we can see our pipes or data channels, right? And they're called subcarriers. So each subcarrier carries a bunch of modulation symbols, a stream of modulation symbols, sorry. And the color indicates the type of information they carry. So what we see here are pretty much uh, most, of, if not all, the LT downlink uh, chan physical channels and signals. So this is only the downlink, but I'm showing the uplink goes on a different frequency in this case, and it looks different than this. But important to remember is we have subcarriers on the frequency axis, and we have OFDM symbols on time axis, and then we have uh, so-called subframe, 10 of those subframes build a frame, and the frame repeats itself over and over again. So it's very structured. The control signals and channels are well identified. Everybody knows it's public, and uh, it's, it's not too flexible. 
in 5G and R, it's more flexible, but it's essentially the same thing, right? You have different control channels that are carried along with the data. The data points are the white ones. Okay, so we'll get to this uh, a few more times during this talk, but uh, so just keep it in mind. Okay, so enough about LT background. Uh, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask. So now let, let me explain what, what we did in terms of software radio development and testing. So the tools that we developed and methodology that we used is the fo as follows. We used commercial off-the-shelf hardware. So we work mostly with Atos Research USRPs that are hooked up to a computer and everything is developed in software. So the innovation comes in software. What we did is we developed custom interference waveforms that uh, kind of replicate the LTE waveforms, okay, the LTE physical layer. So we use OFDM for that, and we do it such a way that we can turn on and off signaling on different subchannels or subcarriers to kind of um, recreate some of the LTE control channels in order to test what happens if those are interfered with, and only those. So uh, what else we can do is we can easily listen into LT commercial or, in, or test base stations and uh, synchronize to them. So then once we do that through these synchronization signals, then we can also uh, launch synchronous attacks to the UE or the network. So this is how it looks like. So we have this configurable waveform that drives the software radio. We can configure the power, the bandwidth, the subcarriers we want to target. This is, this is frequency in this plot. Or the time we want, to, uh, we want to, our signal to be transmitted. This would be the ODM subcarriers, right? So um, we haven't built everything from scratch. So as I mentioned, I've worked in Europe before. We developed a, a tool. It was called, and back in the days, OSLD, Open uh, Source LTE Deployment. And then <coughs> when I went to Virginia Tech, my, my buddy stayed there in, in Barcelona, Ireland. They developed LibLT, and now it's SRS LTE. It's a commercial company. They develop, but they, they have a line of free open source LTE software developed all in C. So we used that and adapted it for our purposes. So here is how a asynchronous interference waveform could look like that we generate. We could, uh, for instance, generate a waveform that only occupies half the band, part of the band, or a single subcarrier. Okay? So it's, it, this is not difficult. So um, it becomes more complex when you want to synchronize to actually to an LTE uh, base station. So what you do here is you, you synchronize to the uh, primary and secondary synchronization symbols. They're transmitted by the base station every five millisecond. And then you can uh, put interference on top of them. So uh, let me take a step back. What you see here is a limited LTE downlink frame that only contains four, uh, essentially three parts of signals. The synchronization signals, the reference signal, signal, and a physical broadcast channel. So the physical broadcast channel uh, gives you information about the cell or the LTE uh, network. The reference signals are pilots that are used for uh, channel estimation and, and coherent demodulation. And these are synchronization sequences that are used by UE to synchronize in time and frequency uh, to the LTE cell. So it's very flexible, the tool that we build. You can just turn on the uh, signals that you like. So we, what we see here is we turn on two um, type of LTE signal. One that has those four elements, and the other one is just interference on top of the uh, synchronization signals. So why did we do this? Well, we had sponsors and we had uh, uh, the, the, the desire to see what happens with real networks, or with real base stations, right? So we had our, uh, back at the time, we had OCS Networks sponsoring a small project where they gave us their ruggedized um, LTE base station or E node B, which comes with an embedded EPC. Uh, this is the core network. So er, this is basically, uh, this is all 3GPP compliant and it's built on top of Ericsson equipment. So everything is standard, right? We are not looking at any specific equipment here. We're looking at the specifications of standard by its, on its own. So what we did here is we connected uh, 
this uh, base station in our lab through cables to, uh, we connected it to an interferer. As the interferer it synchronizes the synchronization signals that a base station transmits every five milliseconds, and then can launch either downlink interference attacks or uplink interference attacks uh, either way, right? And then we want to see uh, what different types of attacks, what effect they have on the communications link. So we looked at those uh, five scenarios. Essentially, the baseline is no interference. Then we looked at full band interference, half band interference, both an uplink and downlink. Then we looked at the uplink interference specifically when we target only the uplink control channel or if we target only the data channel. And finally, we tried to interfere, oh, no, we tried. We interfered with the synchronization signals. So this is the only one that required actually to be synchronized to the cell because we wanted to be very efficient in our interference uh, waveform transmission. So and here are the results. So you can see as the, the baseline, we have this sort of throughput, 12 megabits per second, uh, 8 megabits on a downlink. Uh, this is without interference and with different types of interference. Uh, what happens is that uh, throughput uh, becomes much, uh, worsens much more, right? So we, can, we consider two cases. When the interference signal is at the same level at the, as the transmitted sing, signal, and when the interference waveform is 5 dB above the interference signal. So we can see the effect that it has. Of course, the higher the interference signal, the more uh, throughput loss V is incurred. So notice, of course, if you do the full band interference, you get the uh, most throughput degradation. Uh, when you do half band, you do less. Um, but you can also do some partial interference of control channels or data channels, or only the synchronization signal. Okay, so this clearly showed that you can do like a sort of a smart jammer that can, uh, that can target different sy systems or subsystems of LTE and achieve a diff uh, its, its possible goal of a performance degradation. So uh, why did we do this? Well, we wanted to see can we, what happens if attacks are specific to specific channels and what degradation it, it, it shows. And here the interesting, um, takeaway point is if you don't have much power, you don't want to spend much power interfering in LTE signal, and you just target, for instance, the synchronization signals, which you can do with a uh, commercial off-the-shelf software radio and, and, and simply a few lines of code, then you can save a lot of power and you can just transmit at 25 uh, respect overall power, right, or energy, uh, minus 25 dB with respect to the full band jammer and still achieve a lot of uh, damage to the network. Okay, so uh, here I need to uh, clarify, we are not interested in damaging a network. We are interested in understanding the vulnerability of a network and seeing what we can do to harden the network and make it more uh, uh, reliable. So what we did then in that project is we looked at interference detection methods. So as, as you might know that uh, all the cellular networks collect a ton of data over days and months, they collect this data and they post-process it mostly for efficiency purposes. So what we did is we looked at these uh, key performance indicators and performance measurement counters. I think there are hundreds of them just for the radio access network, right? So we looked at some of them and, and we examined some of their values for different interference types to see uh, if we can detect what's going on or, or when something uh, unexpected is happening. So, uh, and also what we did is combine different inter KPIs, so PM counters, to see if by combining them and then doing some classification, we can understand what type of interference we're expect or we're experiencing. Okay, so this is just a brief overview of, of that type of um, mitigation. And I need to uh, give you some notes here. So this is not uh, the, the ultimate, uh, ultimate solution, right? The problem with these PM counters and KPIs, they're typically not collected for adapting your waveform or your system in real time if there is a smart jammer, let's say, that, that jams your signal. Typically, they use it for performing long-term performance evaluation and optimization of the networks. So for this specific equipment, we collected like 15 minutes of data and then we processed it. However, if you, have, if you use LTE or cellular networks for uh, critical time-critical services, um, we need to have time, timely solutions. So 
in order to do that, I, my recommendation is, to, in addition to try to identify attacks and identify that you're being attacked, also overall tar harden the cellular networks. And possibly go one step beyond and even adapt protocols dynamically before attacks happen, before they become effective. Any questions so far? Good. Okay, so now the second part of my talk, uh, of, of the different, uh, different analysis we did is, we termed the, uh, the concept of LT control channel spoofing. So LT works so well, I mean, uh, very spectrally efficient and, and very efficient in handling users um, because it relies on lots of control signaling. There are lots of control signals that go between the base station and your user equipment, and then the, the uh, the base station or network can schedule your users' sessions smartly in order to give you the best possible throughput and most fair uh, share of um, bandwidth. So we looked here at the thing, what happens if there is a legal base station, as usual, and if there is a ba fake base station around it that also transmits those control signals? How will the UE react? How will the user equipment react? Okay, so a very brief... Uh, um, summary of how an LTUE operates. Once you turn it on, your smartphone, you turn it on, or from airplane mode to normal mode, it looks for networks. So this is called network acquisition. Then it, once it finds a network and synchronizes to the network, it does the, random, does the random access procedure in order to attach to the network. And then after that, authentication happens. So all this signaling here from number one to four is unencrypted and sent in the clear. So once authentication has been uh, established, so the UE knows this is a valid network, the network knows this is a valid UE, then IP connectivity can be, uh, can be uh, provided, encryption starts, and all the nice services you can obtain from the network. So a little more detail about, we're looking here at the connection setup only, and we're looking at those five steps, uh, essentially four steps. Uh, in the first step, it's important, I just want to outline it, the UE searches for those synchronization signals, those yellow and green signals that we have every five milliseconds, and then selects the strongest signal it sees in that band. So there, might, there will most likely be more than just one signal because LT uses a frequency reuse factor of one, and you may hear the next cell as well, right? So, but you have to uh, select a stronger cell. And then it decodes the system information uh, about the cell that is carried both on the, this broadcast channel as well as the regular um, downlink control channel. Okay, so the first experiment I'm going to show you deals only with the network acquisition. And the second experiment uh, goes from network acquisition up to authentication. Okay, so this is a test bed we developed with uh, with some funding that we had uh, for equipment grants. So it's basically an SDR test bed and has some commercial LT, uh, not LT, well, yes, some commercial um, test equipment from Roland Schwartz. This one can act as an eNodeB emulator. So industry uses this device to test conform it, uh, that UEs are co uh, conforming to the standard. We used it to set up an eNodeB. And then we have a shielded box where we have some SDRs and we have a UE. So this is all uh, in an antenna from this uh, Roden Schwarz instrument. So everything is uh, signaled over the air here. And our SDRs is as follows. We used two fake base stations. Uh, one that uses our software-defined radio, open source software-defined radio uh, waveform or protocol. It's LT-like, but it might not be complete. And the other one is commercial. Uh, it's also software-defined radio. We use Amari soft here. It's a commercial, non-open source solution um, that is very, that operates very well and is fully 3GPP compliant. Okay, so for experiment number one, what our fake base station does is it just transmits the synchronization signals. Every five milliseconds, it sends out two OFDM symbols that carry a uh, standard compliant synchronization sequences or modulated symbols. And so the experiment, what we did is we have this 
legitimate E node B and the fake E node B both are turned on at the same time, and then we turn on the UE, and then after some long time or any time, average time, and we haven't seen enough, we turn the uh, fake E node B off. Uh, yes, we turn it off and see what happens. So important to, for this experiment to understand what's going on, there are no other networks around because we're in a shielded box, and uh, no other services around, and, and here is what, what happens. So the UE, once it's turned on, it searches for the cell, and it finds the fake cell. Why it finds the fake cell? Because it's stronger than the legal cell. And now the protocol says, well, you need to attach to the uh, stronger cell. So it tries to attach to the stronger cell, but the stronger cell doesn't offer you anything. It doesn't offer you not even the next control channels you need. And the UE is waiting for those control channels and doesn't see them or doesn't find them. So it automatically treats the cell as being buried or non-existing or non-functional, right, for services. And the standard says if the cell is identified as buried, you should or you can select the second stronger cell. But the UE didn't do that. So uh, we, we tested, I think, two types of UEs or so, and we th believe that this is a device-specific problem. So this is not a uh, standardization issue because standardization allows you to go to the next cell, but the manufacturer of the device might have overlooked this tiny uh, option and have not implemented it. So the UE just sticks there and treats the cell as barred, and since there's no other service around it, it never gets connects to anything. Well, there is another service around it, right? But it's on the same frequency, and it uses lower power. But the U is not is incapable to attach to the cell. OK, so that was our first experiment. So very simple. You just set up the primary synchronization, secondary synchronization signals, and you're done. So the second experiment uses our commercial uh, software radio base station. Um, and it has the entire downlink frame, no data is transmitted. But bear in mind that this base station is fake, so it doesn't know the UE authentication keys. It doesn't know about the UEs, okay? So the authentication will, uh, it will impossibly uh, happen. So again, we did the same scenario and the same results come up. So the UE is not able to attach to a legal enode that's there and on all the time because of the fake E node B that just transmits the, the signaling at higher power. In this case, um, after the UE identifies the strongest cell, which is a fake E node B, it goes, moves on to decode the control information that is sent on the other channels. So the interferer or the attacker has two options here. It can sense this legal E node B's um, identity or number and then use it, the same number for his fake E node B. And within the control messages that come after the synchronization, it can tell the UE this cell is barred through signaling. So the UE uh, list, hears that and accepts it, and it, then what it cannot do anymore for five minutes, it won't try to use the cell again. So this is all in the standards. And the other option is that the fake E node B doesn't do anything fan that's fancy. It just moves on, and of course it has the wrong authentication keys, and authentication will fail. So authentication fails, the UE still sticks to the fake E node B. It's incapable of moving to the legal E node B that's next to it, or in the same band, that has its keys. Okay, so we, we believe that this is a big issue, and. Uh, Specifically, two things. One is the fake E node B can, through signaling, through messaging, can bar a legal cell very easily. And second point is authentication failure that happened in, the, in, in this B example doesn't raise any flags. So, well, the UE is not authentified, but the UE still thinks it needs to connect that network. So we th thought this is a flaw in the standard. Fortunately, uh, there is a simple mitigation me mechanism for that. So what we, can, what we propose to do is to report a list of all cells at any given frequency that the UE sees to the higher layers. 
And then also, based on experiment one, we propose that the next stronger cell should be selectable when not receiving the control messages that are required or transmitted by a real E node B. Then for the second experiment that we did, uh, we propose to differentiate between a buried cell, a, a cell signal that's buried, and authentication failure. So if the UE uh, gets the message, this cell is buried, it should check for duplicate cell ID. Because we, we have seen that the fake E node B can bear a legal cell, right? And for authentication failure, if, uh, if duplicate cell ID is identified by the UE, and authentication fails, then the UE should be able to, to look for the next stronger cell. And by the way, I have now explained why the, UE, why the standard has decided the UE just can't connect to the strongest cell. Well, they made it because they wanted to uh, avoid that the UE connects to the cell that's further apart and then create potential interference among the UEs and networks in different coverage areas of different cells, right? But uh, these, these two exceptions won't probably uh, harm the original idea of just picking always the stronger cell. So the good news is, this is a simple software fix at the UE. It doesn't change the, it doesn't change the LT network, just the UE. And it's fully backward, backward compatible with ex existing LT networks. And actually, yeah, we published this, a few papers, and actually part of this got uh, introduced in the 3GPP release 13. So we did the research before 3GPP release 13 was uh, finalized. And they adopted some of these techniques to make a cells or UEs up from that, that are 3GPP release 13 and forward compliant, more resilient to this time of attacks. Any questions? So quickly to wrap up, what about 5G? Well, 5G new radio uh, has a similar, uses OFDM again, uses control signaling. It's much more flexible in LTE. It has lots of flexibility, operates in different bands and so forth, but um, the waveform, is, at least for release 15, is, is the same as for LTE. So that's one point to remember. The other one is we did look at the 5G security architecture, was released last year, March, and we looked at it. And it has much stronger security mechanism than LTE. It allows these pre-authentication messages to be encrypted. It allows, using a public key system, it allows the the user identity to be encrypted, right, as opposed to LTE. So, however, we saw potential issues with this uh, security architecture. Some of them are listed here. First of all, there are many sec security implementation options, and many of them are optional. So it's up to the network operator to decide which one he wants to implement, and when and how. So many security features are just mentioned, but not specified. The specifications say this is be beyond the scope of the specifications. And uh, null encryption is still supported for uh, if the UE or the network is incapable of using encryption, for instance. So this can be bad. And then there's, of course, how are keys distributed? What happens if you roam between different networks? Networks you've never roamed before. How do you know the public key of that network, right? So how do you store or, or share and update those keys? So all those issues and many more, we have uh, written a paper, it's published on open access, about possible uh, protocol of air uh, exploits of 5G, according to the latest, I mean, release 15 ar security architecture. And we d haven't done any SDR testing yet, but uh, this is my conclusion. We need to do more testing, and we need to test those networks as they will be offer more, mission, more and more mission critical uh, applications and services, and research has shown, not just by us, but many people, that uh, 4G and 5G networks are very insecure and vulnerable, and again, not just to those jamming attacks and spoofing attacks, but also to higher layer protocol exploits. So what we did is we used, and, and others did, we used SDR test beds and find them very useful if you can develop things in software quickly to demonstrate vulnerabilities and possible fixes to them, right? And what we now uh, suggest, what we're working on, is on open source implementations of next generation protocols, such as 5G and R. And also we're working on 
protocol or signaling analysis toolboxes that are fully SDR and open source, where you can actually uh, listen to networks, whether commercial or experimental, and, and uh, decrypt. Not, you don't need to decrypt, you don't have the, um, the user IDs. But just listen to the signaling and see how, how often is the user actually giving away its unique identifier. How often does the temporary identifier change, right? So those are all good features that, that a network operator should uh, implement correctly. And those tools can help you um, tracking those down. Thank you very much. Any questions? So questions. Oh, yeah, great talk. Thank you. Um, your last slide basically conclusion about the vulnerabilities of 4G and 5G. How, how, how do you feel this plays into URLC, which is fundamentally ultra-reliable, low-latency communication used for, in most cases, mission-critical? We haven't looked at that specific, uh, but I would like to learn about it. I thought it's more targeted towards this latency, lowering latency. And also ultra reliability, specifically around mission critical tasks like Good. yeah, I haven't looked at it specifically. Automation of like factory equipment that if things go wrong, things go really badly wrong. Thank you. Good comment. So in regard to the five G aspect of that, so <clears throat> you probably know that, but the. The SS blocks in 5G, uh, the, the starting symbol, the PSS symbol, uh, it does not, I mean, its, its location is not, uh, is not constant. It keeps changing. So, you know, hypothetically, even if you were to detect the strongest PSS, or, well, strongest, the, the strongest SS block or based on the PSS, the next one will not come at mm -hmm. equal time distance it becomes much harder to create, you know, uh, craft an attack to, to, um, to attack, you know, to kind of spoof an PSS signal. That's one thing. The other thing is that even in the frequency domain, in the subcarrier domain, in contrast to LTE, mm -hmm. uh, these uh, 127 subcarriers located for the synchronization signals are actually shifting in frequency. Correct. It's, it's very hard to actually identify where they are. Yes. Great comment. Yeah, it's much more fluid and flexible, 5G and R, than the strict LTE frame, like signaling frame. And we, in this paper, we don't look at this at all. We just look at the specs and what might be, um, might be a little bit not specific enough, in our opinion. We don't look at the signaling frame at all. But that's right. Yeah, it's much more fluid. And it all already allows a little bit what I wanted to do is uh, to adapt the network, right, in advance of attacks, maybe. Great point. Thank you. Uh, any other questions for Vuk? Any security questions? How safe are we? <laughs> <laughs> OK. So with that, let's thank Vuk uh, Marievich again for an excellent Thank you. Talk.